So I'm a product designer, associate director at Therefore Product Design Consultants, one of the UK's leading innovation and design consultancies. This is a story about innovation, development, and money. And unusually, it's about a product that wasn't designed for you. It's a story that begins and ends with people and a problem. These images are of Gravity Light being field trialed in 26 countries by some fantastic trial facilitators, 55 organizations in all. These are the people part of the story. To explain what Gravity Light is and why and how this came to be, first, I'm going to tell you a bit about a problem which I knew very little about back in 2009. This is a world map. And this is numbers of people in millions off-grid without access to electricity. Now, all up, they had to 2 billion people, nearly a third of the world's population. I found this statistic incredible. I had no idea that this was the case. And my first reaction was, well, when will these people be connected? Surely it's just a matter of time. But the fact is that if you're rural or remote, the rate of expansion of the electricity network is only going to be reducing these numbers by 0.4% a year. But these people aren't all rural and remote. Many of them are urban. They have electricity available if they could get connected, but they can't get connected because they can't afford it. There's another thing that's interesting about this map is that it could easily be about something else. It could be numbers of people without access to clean, safe drinking water, or basic medical care, or people living on less than $2 a day. And there's a good reason for that. The reason for that is that all of these things are very strongly interconnected. They all form part of a picture of poverty. Now, in 2009, we took a brief from a charity, unusual brief for a design consultancy, because they were working across the middle belt of Africa to eradicate kerosene lighting. Now, when you're off-grid, what do you do for lighting? There are so many things that we take for granted that it's hard to actually work out what life would be like off-grid. We certainly wouldn't have a lot of the fantastic technology and communications that we're all involved in and enjoying fantastic talks about today. Those things aren't really easily available. But there are more basic things, refrigeration, heating, lighting. What do you do for home lighting if you're off-grid? Well, the likelihood is you're going to use kerosene. So SolarAid are trying to eradicate kerosene from Africa. And they're not doing this by giving away lanterns. They're doing this by building a network of entrepreneurs to distribute and sell their solar products as viable solutions to people who now rely on kerosene. But SolarAid had a problem. And this is the problem that I was referring to. The problem was that their products are too expensive. They were out of the reach of the people that they really wanted to reach most. They felt if only they could find a way to make a product for $6, well, we'll come back to that, then it could really change the game. So what's kerosene lighting? That's a kerosene lamp on the left that you or I might have come across, a hurricane lantern, but that's not the sort of kerosene lamp I'm talking about. The images on the right are a kerosene lamp. It's a bottle, very often a homemade wick, and it's a bottle filled with flammable liquid. It makes your home a dangerous place to be. It puts out noxious black smoke. The World Bank estimates that in Africa alone, 780 women and children breathe fumes equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day. In India, every year, there are one and a half million cases of severe burns caused by overturned kerosene lanterns. Fires rip through densely packed urban slums. Fires rip through refugee camps. But then there's the cost. If you light your home with kerosene, up to 20% of your household income can be consumed in paying for it. And if 20% of your income is being spent on kerosene, how do you save up for an alternative? That's why it's a poverty trap. You can't afford an alternative. So we learned how people light their homes off-grid. This was news to us. We learned about the scale of this, saw the ubiquity of it. Two billion people 
We saw how it keeps people in poverty, shortens life, and causes suffering. So we could see the need. And a product for $6. There's the brief. So where do you start? Well, you start by looking at what exists and what it costs to make and what you might be able to do. So crudely, we looked broadly. These are the parts that make up small lighting solutions which are off-grid. You've got solar panels or it might be a wind-up device. But typically, you're going to be harvesting energy at one time, storing it, and using it later. Your home lighting is your lighting when it's gone dark. So naturally, you need to harvest energy, store it, and use it later. And whichever way you chop up this list of bits, when you look at the costs of them, it always adds up to too much. And really, we felt that the culprit in this was the rechargeable batteries. The batteries can make up a full third of the cost of these products. And what's more, they're very short-lived. The batteries are the shortest lived part of any of these systems, and they can be defunct in 18 months. They need quite sophisticated or expensive charge circuitry to keep them with any kind of a life. So you could make the batteries smaller, and you could make the panel smaller, but very quickly you can find that you end up with a product that's so compromised it doesn't actually answer the need. If you have a rainy day, then you have no light that night, so you still need kerosene. So what's the minimum you need? It got us thinking. Because we were going to have to say to SolarAid that we feel this simply can't be done. And we don't like saying that. And we could see the need. So maybe there was a different way. In thinking about what's the minimum that you could use, a good way to do it is to start thinking about what people already have and how you might be able to use it. What do people have in abundance? So. This is a product concept. Some LEDs, right, that creates the light. A generator creates the power. And some gears to drive the generator. And a weight. Now, the beauty of this is that's the bit that everybody's got. Everybody's got weight. Mass is pretty common. So you send a product, and then you, it comes in a bag. And you put some weight in the bag that you find yourself. And then you have a system for delivering light. Now, if you do the sums on what a system like this might deliver, and you look at the power output, you might stop there. Because believe me, it's marginal. And you might think this isn't even worth trying. Because if you look at, say, light levels in the European regulations for the workplace, you'd find that you were nowhere near. This would be inadequate. But we didn't ask that question. We asked ourselves, what do people live with now? What do kerosene lights give people? If we could do something many times better than a kerosene lantern, then we might have a viable solution that people could afford. And it turns out, you can. It's partly to do with improvements in LED technology, but it's also partly to do with trying it. Now, this is a pretty rubbish answer to a brief for a solar lantern. And it wasn't what SolarAid were after, understandably. But we still wanted to try it. So this is trying it. This is a series of prototypes, and this is the nuts and bolts of what I've been doing for the last three years or so. And the first thing you do is you do away with everything you might normally put in that costs any money. And you see how it goes. Well, in truth, at first, it didn't go well. <laughs> but it's an iterative process. You see what doesn't work, you move on, you see what does work, and you improve upon it. But it's a tough brief. If this is going to be a solution, it not only needs to be highly efficient, it needs to be small, it needs to be super low cost. Everything must be costed. All the way along, every change or alteration you make in this process, you need to check whether it's taking you closer or further away from your target. And you have to test it in the dark. There's no point looking at the numbers. You need to stand in a darkened space with the light coming from this prototype and see whether you feel it's about right. So we arrived at a product design. And we were satisfied that it had met our initial requirements. It gave half an hour of light for a lift of about 10 kilos. You lift this 10 kilos of weight 
up above head height, it comes down and it gives you half an hour of light. It's also a generator. It can power other things. It seemed really quite exciting and viable. We took it around to see some people. Okay, we might think we might have an answer here. But they were still very skeptical. Understandably, will people really want to lift a weight every 30 minutes or so to provide their home lighting? Will it survive the rigors of the environment that it needs to survive? And indeed, that skepticism didn't stop. I'll come back to that later. So, therefore, supports in-house innovation. After all, that's what Therefore Limited is about, innovation. We decided that the only way we were going to sort of demonstrate this was to try to do a field trial. And we estimated that we needed about 55,000 US dollars to do that. So, we were stuck. It was kind of make or break. We decided to crowdfund it. Now, the crowdfunding campaign at the end of 2012 reached its target in four days, $55,000. And when a campaign starts off on a trajectory like that, it gathers even more attention. It sort of snowballs. People got it. People got it for the same reasons we did. They could see the problem, and they could see that a solution was needed, and it grew. Partway through the campaign, Bill Gates tweeted about it. Now, apparently, Bill Gates doesn't tweet very often, so we feel very honored about that. And that's, that's the impact that Bill Gates has on internet traffic when he sends a tweet, the graph on the right. <laughs> so thank you, Bill. In the end, after 40 days, the campaign closed and we'd raised $400,000. But it wasn't just funds that we'd acquired. We'd acquired a network of connections. We had inquiries from international NGOs, from governments, from private individuals, from consumers in on-grid markets that said, well, we want one of these. People have experienced hurricanes and tsunamis. They know what power outages are about. And actually, even if you're ecologically minded, this can seem like an attractive thing to have. Aid organizations got in touch with us because it seems that this could solve a problem that we weren't even aware of. Products that contain batteries can't be stored. You can't put a provision away in readiness for a disaster. With the batteries removed, you have a product that can be stored. But what we also got was hundreds of offers to help with the trial, a network of trial facilitators. So we had our prototype. It was tested and it was delivering functionally, but all of a sudden this was a somewhat bigger scale than we'd anticipated. And we had more development funding. So we set about employing those funds to accelerate the development to a fully realized product. And that actually involves breaking a lot of things, testing a lot of things, but it's also a complete re-evaluation. You look at how much is it going to cost to assemble, really what, uh, how is it going to be uh, distributed effectively. So we wanted to be as ready for launch as possible by the time the trial came with a fully realized product. And this was our product design. We'd added some features to it. One of the things about Gravity Light is that the more weight you add, the more light it gives. That's a great thing. It's also potentially a bad thing. You hang an engine on this, and it's not going to like it. So we had to find a way to communicate clearly to the user who's filling a bag with an unknown amount of weight that they were in the right kind of ballpark. So we developed a low-cost system that detects if it's been overloaded and communicates that really clearly. The whole thing lights up bright red. It says, please stop. Also, we developed a peripheral. Now, this peripheral has changed the offering completely as a solution. This is called Satellite. Because Gravity Light is a generator, it means it can also power other things. It can power radios. It can power peripheral lights. It can even do some battery charging. But these peripheral lights, you plug one into the back of Gravity Light, and you take it over and you hang it to where it needs to be. Maybe it's where you're going to be studying or cooking. You can plug another satellite into the first satellite and take that over to where it needs to be. It's something that I came across really early in this process of trying things out. That actually you can keep attaching LEDs and there's this really funny behavior where you seem to get more light. You're sharing the power evenly, but you seem to get more light. So you can run up to about six of these lights and give people a wired home. A wired home is what you aspire to if you're off-grid. So we sent out this kit for trial. It's a bag. You take the bag, you fill it with soil or earth or rocks, you hang gravity light up in your home, you attach the weight, lift the weight, and it's running. 
light and power on demand. A three seconds charge for 25 minutes of power. That's very different from previous products where you need to maybe give three or four minutes of time and effort to get half an hour payback. Three seconds for 25 minutes. Instantly available anytime. It doesn't matter where you live, whether it's been rainy, whether it's the monsoon, whether it's dark. You have instantly available power when you need it. And it's got no running costs. It can outlast existing products potentially by many times and it pays for itself in weeks. But what's crucially different about Gravity Light is it's designed to replace kerosene lighting. There aren't a great many products that are designed for the world's poorest people, and you don't have to be an economist to understand why that is. But when you start with a blank sheet of paper, and you ask yourself, really, what do people need, then it takes you on a different path. This is John David. He's in Liberia. He's had a light installed by one of our trial facilitators, and he's being helped here by a local girl who uh, is helping him through with the instructions. He said to the facilitator, I'm really happy now. Now my environment won't be dark. This is Kwee Kwee. Kwee Kwee's 22 years old. He's a family of 12, and he's the sole breadwinner for his grandparents, parents, and siblings. His father fell ill last year, and they're, they're, he's housebound. So their lighting is currently consuming half of their income. And so it builds. Bangladesh, Guatemala, Liberia, and it builds. 26 countries in all. We're receiving the feedback that Gravity Light is a solution to people's problems. So make Gravity Light available at the lowest possible cost. We've put a structure in place for the organizations because we need to get, now that we have a product, to scale. We need to reach the people that we're aiming to reach. It's a two-part organization. Initially, it can take in charitable funds and employ them effectively to subsidize the high cost at start while we reach scale. Low cost only comes with scale. In the interim, we will subsidize products. But we're going to take the opportunities that we've come to realize are there for retailing the product in consumer markets, in on-grid situations, and in relief markets, and we're going to launch the product globally. Because ultimately, we feel the same way that SolarAid did, that the only solution to this problem is to provide people with the means to solve their own problems, and that's about growing the economy. So. We have a structure, we have a product. Bill, if you're listening and you get to see this, it's about the greatest time to get back in touch. <laughs> I used to have a job. It was a great job. And now I have a mission. Many thanks. <laughs>